Thank everyone for being here on behalf of A16. Uh, we do these Wild Wednesdays every, not every Wednesday, but uh, frequently, maybe about a time or two a month. There's a bunch of them that are scheduled out here into, uh, into April. So uh, be, if you're not on the website uh, or if you're not on our mailing list, email list, you know, please, please sign up for that. I'm John Mead from A16, and it's, it's just delightful to be able to do these uh, as much as we do them, to just a part of the whole outdoor community. And uh, I see a lot of familiar faces and some new faces, and it's just a way to kind of keep that, keep that uh, spirit alive that uh, we started so long ago with the, the weekly and the monthly um, programs at, at A16 back in the day. So we do have a website, and, and uh, we're giving up on selling gear. We're not going to do that, but we sell swag. So if you're so inclined, you get on the site, and you can see some fun stuff. It's all designed to... Uh, to bring back some memories about A16 and also to inspire explorations, inspire, inspire people to get out and, and learn and do things and, and use the, the outdoors uh, responsibly. Uh, I want to thank our, uh, our hosts here uh, at Helix Brewing. Um, Cameron Ball and the, the team here allow us to come in and use this any Wednesday night of the, of the, of the month of the year that we would like to. And uh, so we're very appreciative of them. And if you're inclined to drink uh, craft beer, then, you know, please indulge. If you're not, we've got water and they've got some seltzers or, or go, or don't drink anything at all. Um, everybody saw the pizza truck outside. You can't miss that. So um, other announcements, I want to thank Mike Moriarty. Mark is our filmmaker and here again tonight. He does this out of passion. Uh, we've become friends um, in the last four or five years. It was part A16 was part of his life, and he was looking for a way to help and give back. And and certainly by posting the presentations on our YouTube channels, uh, our ch YouTube channel actually it's my YouTube channel at uh, Pine Media. Um, you can see the present many of the presentations, most of them, about 90% of the presentations that we've done. You can see them uh, if you need to because. If you go too fast, you can you can go back and review or send you know tell friends about it. So uh, it's nice to have that record, and we really appreciate that, Mike. Um, tonight, tonight we're going to explore some survival skills, and we I was just so thrilled. One of the one of the most successful programs we did in L.A. in Tarzana was Keith coming in and doing a survival class. And I thought, well, you know, that's gone. I mean, he's up there, we're down here. He's not gonna come down. And out of the blue, he called and, and uh, said, I would love to come down. And I was like, we can't pay anything. He said, I will drive down, I'm passionate about this. And uh, so he has come all the way today from Sim Simi Valley. Uh, he's gonna drive back tonight. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we were so thrilled that somebody of his caliber uh, can come down and give us a presentation. Normally, we start uh, our meet, meet and drinks at 6.30. Today, you'll notice we started at 6 because there's so much to cover. It's going to be about a two-hour program, is what, I'm, what I can recall. Um, and anyway, I'm just delighted that you would come down and do this for us uh, out My of the goodness pleasure. of your heart and as part of the spirit of A16 and the outdoors and to spread the, spread the word about responsibly uh, using the outdoors. So I'll give you a key. Keith Ferrara. Thank you, John. All right. So there is, there is one typo that John sent out. If you ever look at my bio that I sent John, I never put the word expert uh -oh. in there. So <laughs> that's John. I don't ever consider myself to be an expert, but uh, I've been doing this a long time. I have a lot of knowledge on it. And today, the, the idea, can you guys hear me okay back there? All right. The idea today is to give you a solid foundation of wilderness survival. This is a two hour presentation of my seven hour class. So I'm gonna go kind of quick, but if, you know, if I miss something or if I say something and you don't catch it, please let me know and I can slow down and go through it again if it's something you need to know about. So 
I want to go kind of quick, but I don't, I don't want anybody to get stuck on what, what did he just talk about? What was that? That kind of thing. So please let me know. Um, the big difference between this and also the full day class is the hands on where the full day class, you know, everybody that attends the class is making fires and putting up shelters and learning knots and those kind of things. But today it's just going to be more, you know, talking about it, demoing it. I don't have any audio visual stuff because it's more just me showing you things. I have a few uh, laminates I'll pass around as we go. But I want to go through a few things about wilderness survival with you guys. But by the time this is over, you should feel pretty comfortable in making a survival kit based on what I'm showing you today, based on your needs. Not primitive. This is not primitive skills. Um, if we get a chance, I'll, I'll get an ember for you with a bow and drill set. But that's really not what I expect of you guys. I expect you guys to learn how to make a fire with basic tools that are available to you. Um, you got a lot of people are asking about what, what's the chicken there for and there's a, there's a deadfall trap over there set up to, to catch food. But again, those are more primitive skills and as much as I enjoy that, I don't think it's really fair to, to bring people into a, a seminar like this and show you primitive skills when you want to learn, hey, what can I get, what can I bring to make myself safe and take care of survival. And I do it a little different um, in the sense of, there's that old saying, you know, if you, uh, you know, if you give a man a fish versus teaching a man to fish, you guys have all heard that, or, or my favorite, you know, if, if you give a man a fire, he's going to be warm for one night. If you set a man on fire, he'll be warm for the rest of his life or something like that. But the whole, the whole point is, you know, these guys that give you a list, carry this, carry that, I always felt that was really doing a disservice to people because here's a bunch of tools. Okay, what do I do with them? I've got all this stuff to carry, but what do I do with this stuff? So I don't teach it that way. I teach it a little differently, which you guys will see as we go on. So one of the first things I always talk about is why learn wilderness survival. Obviously, accidents happen. People get lost. People have accidents in the wilderness. Um, these days, with electronics, you should be able to get rescued pretty quick. As a matter of fact, um, I have some statistics here, and 93% and of people are rescued within 24 hours. That's 93%, and then 95 are rescued within three days. So we kind of work off of that. You know, obviously you could go longer, but having the knowledge of what to do is going to be very helpful. So odds are you're, you're, if you go out and you do the things you're supposed to do, so what's, what's the one thing they always tell you to do before you go out on a backpacking trip? Tell, right, tell somebody, but I kind of add to that a little bit. I say tell somebody responsible. You know, it's really important because sometimes we pick people and they're just, you know, they're not the most responsible person. So tell somebody that's responsible. Tell somebody that's, you know, has your best interest at heart. You know, my wife has a pretty big life insurance policy on me, so I tell my sister when I'm going out. My <laughs> wife doesn't, isn't the one I depend on. So that's real important, you know, but when can that fail? When can that system fail? I told this person, um, I'm going out, I'm going to be here, here, I'm going to be back in seven days. When can that fail on you? You've told a responsible person, so they're going to know. But if you think about it, what if, what if you get hurt or injured the first day? They're not looking for you for another six days. So you've got to be a little bit self-reliant. And that's kind of the reason I teach this the way I teach it. It's really important that you guys know what these things are, how to address a uh, survival situation, and what, what it is, how we prioritize things. And then once we learn to prioritize things, what are the things I should carry to do that? So rather than give you a list of gear, we're going to talk about how we prioritize. Um, there's an interesting thing. Well, let me talk real quick. What circumstances can get you into a survival situation? So I just, you know, I always check these things and check different websites to find out what's going on with people and things that are causing them to be either lost or hurt out there. What reason are they calling search and rescue? So number one for search and rescue is trips and falls. People get caught, you know, trip and fall, sprain their ankle, those kind of things. Search and rescue gets called out. Uh, fatigue and physical condition. Somebody did way more than they thought they could. They just can't make it back. Search and rescue gets called out. Lost hiker. Anybody here ever been lost? Just even for a few moments. What's it feel like? It, it's like this, this thing in the pit of your stomach, right? Wait, did you say you've been lost? All right, well, John, John's, an, John's an outdoor professional, so just to clarify, we don't get I'm lost. Not an expert. Yeah. 
out, outdoor professionals don't get lost. We may get turned around for a few days at a time, but we're, <laughs> we're never lost. Um, other things, weather, obviously people have heat-related injuries. One thing I thought was really interesting, evacuations, gastrointestinal issues. A lot of people develop really bad gastrointestinal issues on uh, outings and stuff, and some of them have to be evacuated even in that sense. Um, drowning, drowning's a big one. You know, people drown, but I can't help you there. Just don't get real close to the water, don't fall in, but that's not one of the, I'm not gonna teach swimming today. Sometimes it's one thing, other times it's a combination of things. It's getting lost. Now all of a sudden you get that sinking feeling in the pit of your stomach and you're not focused. You're just, you feel like, I don't know where I am. And you start walking around and you don't see this big hole in the ground and you stick your foot in there, you twist your ankle. So it can sometimes be a combination of things, not just one thing. Um, primitive skills versus modern skills. Today, like I said, it's gonna be modern skills. I personally love primitive skills. I enjoy teaching primitive skills. I think the primitive skills give us a really deep connection to nature, learning how to make fire off the landscape, learning how to make cordage out of yucca leaves or milkweed or stinging nettle. Those are really nice skills to have. But they're, to me, it's more of just kind of a hobby. I would never, if I were in a survival situation and needed to make a fire, last thing I want to do is rub sticks together. It's just not, you know, I'm going to work out another way to make fire. But it is, it's a great connection. And I think more and more these days, you're seeing mental health issues. People are losing that connection to nature. You guys are all nature people. That's why you're here. But it's, it's deeper for me, at least. You know, I, I am not a hiker backpacker in the sense of just walking through. There's a naturalist named John Young and he says, you know, if you're just walking through, you've missed it all. I'll stop and I'll look at every track and try and identify the track. I'll look at every plant. What plant might that be? What are the Native American uses for the plant? Things like that. It's, it's that nature connection that I think help, helps keep people sane. I mean, I feel different when I'm out there. You guys probably do too. That's why you're here. So I love primitive skills. I suggest, you know, if it's something that interests you, learn them. I'll leave some cards out here for Christopher's classes. Christopher Nergesh owns a school of self-reliance. I'm one of his instructors occasionally. I assist him occasionally. Uh, but that's where you can go consistently to learn ethnobotany and learn other survival skills. And he'll spend a whole day on fire and also learn about primitive skills. So that's my thing. Then, then we have the modern skills or what we're going to do today. And then you have kind of something in the middle called bushcraft. I don't know if anybody's heard of bushcraft, but that's really kind of more crafting things. Let me just grab something over here real quick. Um, you know, that's gonna be not primitive skills, but you're, you know, boiling water in an old tomato can, tomato paste can, and you gotta get it off, off of the embers and you're gonna carve a stick with a Y branch so you could pick up the water and pour it into whatever you wanna pour it in. Right, so those are those kind of skills. Those are just more fun. Bushcraft is a lot of fun to learn all those kind of things. But really, the whole idea today is to get you guys set, understanding survival, and then you go home. I, I used to say when I did the seminars, you know, they have little flash sales. Go buy all this stuff at A16. You know, you can go on Amazon and get most of this stuff now, and um, you know, develop develop your kit. But you, we'll talk more about kits as we get on. So biggest killers in the wilderness, real quick, I just wanna go over this real fast for you guys. Drowning is number one, believe it or not. Catastrophic Falls, okay, Grand Canyon. Last time I was at the Grand Canyon, they had a whole area blocked off. And I'm a volunteer for National Park Service. I got to talk to one of the rangers and explain to me somebody went off the side and now, now it's a recovery versus a rescue. I think you all know the difference between the two. Um, and I said, how often does this happen? And they said, more than you realize. We were in Flagstaff and looked on the, on the TV news. There was nothing about it. So you don't hear about a lot of these people falling, you know, these catastrophic falls. But um, it's just, you know, not getting so close to the edge where you can fall and, and get hurt is a big thing. But that is, that's like number two is catastrophic falls. Exposure is one of them. You guys are probably thinking exposure was one of the biggest killers. You know, more, more than not hypothermia, getting too cold. Um, you know, low body temperature and stuff versus hyperthermia getting too hot. But if you look at case studies in Arizona, people are dying all the time in the summertime in Arizona because they, you know, they just went out there and they weren't prepared middle of the day in the summer. It's just not the time to be hiking in southern Arizona. Um, so both can, can get you as far as exposure. 
Uh, something, I, I have a list of a lot of different survival rescues, recoveries, but I don't want to go through much of it with you guys. But I do want to mention um, a 72-year-old hiker in Sierra Nevada was lost for nine days. This woman had pretty much no survival skills at all, didn't know anything. She was lost for nine days before they found her. And that just shows you what the, the will to live is, the value of that will to live and the will to go on is really good, where experienced people have died in a much shorter time because they gave up. So really, don't, you don't want to give up, and we'll talk more about that as we go on. Um, average deaths in the year, in the wilderness per year, hypothermia, about 700. B and wasp stings, 48. That would be somebody that's got anaphylaxis, somebody goes in anaphylactic shock. Snake bites, five, not very many that they're lethal. And bear attacks, two. You know, that's probably up in Alaska. That's probably not down here at all. So trip preparation. We talked a little bit about that, right? Tell somebody going when you plan to return. This pretty basic stuff. Uh, we talked about when the system can, can fail. So what else are we doing in trip preparation? We're, we're dressing accordingly. Okay, I don't want to get too much into that. Know the layering system here. If anybody here doesn't understand the layering system or you haven't heard of the layering system, you know, go online and look up some videos and they'll talk about, you know, going from a base layer to a mid layer to a warmth layer to a shell layer and so on and get to know all that. And obviously the thickness of each layer is going to be dependent on the conditions that you're hiking in. But understand how to layer and do those kind of things. That's, that's really, really important. Um, anybody ever heard the term cotton kills? That's a big term like with the scouts and stuff like that. My favorite quote is from uh, David Westcott. David Westcott used to own Boulder Outdoor Survival School. He does all like the rabbit stick rendezvous, the primitive skills rendezvous and things. He had a great quote because I, I always would talk about cotton kills. No, it doesn't. And he said, cotton doesn't kill. Stupidity kills. And that really, he's right because if you're out and it's a really hot day and you have a cotton shirt on, that's going to help cool you. You're going to sweat and that evaporative cooling is going to keep you cool. I like hiking in cotton shirts in the summertime. However, if you're in a survival situation, you went off the trail, you're lost, you can't get back, and you've got that cotton shirt on and it's wet and night's coming and it's getting cold, you better have a synthetic shirt in your backpack to change into because cotton holds on to that water. So that's why we say stupidity kills, not cotton kills. That's, that's one of my favorite quotes. So just be aware of it. Um, try and understand a little bit about the layering system, which I'm sure most of you already know. But if you don't, research a little bit on layering, how to layer for, for these things, and, and try it out. Practice with, with different layerings when you go on hikes and see what's comfortable, what works for you. I used to have some pullover uh, fleece, and I finally got to a point where I'm like, you know, there's times I don't want to take it off. I just want to vent. And I've gone from pull over quarter zips to, to full zips now because with a full zip I can vent better. Personal taste, you know, that's just me. A lot of people still like the, the quarter zip or three quarter zip, whatever you want to call it, those kind of things. So it's really going to be personal preferences. And as well as anything that I show you here today from, you know, a basic uh, fire starter, which we'll cover in a little bit, you know, you want to practice with these things. So not just your clothing and getting familiar with your clothing, but there's any item of survival that I talk about and teach you about today if you can afford to buy two, buy two. Practice with one of them. If not, buy one and practice with the one you have. Just don't wear it out, but get, you know, get to know how to use these things. That's, that's of critical. So you also, gear selection, right? You want to be familiar with your gear before you go. I want to get through this part real quick because it's not really survival. It's just kind of what you do when you go hiking or backpacking. When I go with the scouts, um, they have all their gear in a shed by the church that sponsored them. Well, there was this one trip where they went out and they brought tents and, and they had this one pretty good sized tent and they brought two poles for a three pole tent. They forgot the other pole. So that's why don't try a new tent out in the field. Try it out in your backyard. Get to know your gear before you get out there. It's really critical that you're familiar with, you know, I've, I've gone on trips and even like outdoor seminars where I've been there a couple days and a lot of people show up. They have no idea how to set up their tent. Luckily, there's people to help them, but if you're out you know, in the wilderness and you bought a tent, please try it out in your backyard. Learn how to set it up. Learn how it all works and everything like that. So that's gear selection. Know the resources. You know, you're going somewhere, get an idea where the water is. I think there's even an app. I just heard this the other day. There's an app for the phone that tells you, you know, whether you're on the AT or the PCT or the CDT, kind of tells you where the water stops are. That was kind of interesting. You're always learning new stuff. 
But this one guy said, yeah, I use this app and it tells me where, so I know I don't carry too much weight in water. I know where the next source is. So that's kind of a neat thing. So uh, familiarize yourself with the resources. Most of us probably use our phones to navigate, but still learn map and compass. Sometimes the phone breaks. I think it's a good idea to still know how to use a compass, understand how to adjust for declination, um, not just with a compass that's adjustable because that's easy. You just turn the little screw and then there's your declination and now you're like, oh, okay, cool, I know where to go. Learn how to do it without that. Learn how to do the math, okay? And I'm not great with math. I was always more better with English. But, you know, learn how to do the subtracting and adding, going from the map to the compass, the compass to the map, those kind of things. Because you could go on a trip and what happens if you forgot your compass and you wind up plain lands in Glacier National Park? You gotta run into a big five or somewhere, get a compass, doesn't have declination adjustment. So you need to kind of know that stuff, all right? Everybody depends on their phones, and I do too. I'm guilty of it, go out, oh, phone tells me to do this, this, but if the phone stops working. So good, good idea to know how to work the mechanical backup for these kind of things. Um, as you're walking, you know, take note of things around you, the plants, the animals, that kind of thing. Uh, if you know how to, and you know, if you know how to track, if you know the difference between dog tracks and cat tracks, so mountain lion, coyote, those kind of things, it's always a good way to find water sources because the animals are going to go to water sources a couple times a day, and we'll talk more about that as as we go on. Um, environmental concerns, knowing how to deal with lightning, and and that's kind of a that's a seminar all in itself is understanding how lightning works and you know, side streamers and upward streamers and knowing where to go. Where do I go if, you know, if the lightning comes on and stuff. So just one, you know, one giveaway, the tent's not gonna help you. <laughs> okay, tent's not gonna stop lightning. So understanding, you know, you gotta get into kind of a lower clump of trees and, and kind of don't be in an open field. But I don't wanna get too much into lightning. On the actual trip, pay attention to weather changes. You know, see what's going on. Is, is the weather going the way I thought it would go? But again, you should be prepared for pretty much anything if you've got the right clothing. And that's also another topic. You know, hiking inherently is more dangerous than backpacking because why is that? Backpackers have all their stuff with them. I've seen hikers, I, I volunteer out at Malibu Creek State Park. I've hiked out to the MASH site on a summer day and I see people, they're at the MASH site and they're out of water and they've got to hike the three miles back. And it's midday and it's hot. So, you know, those are the kind of things you want to be aware of. So if you get lost, let's start with that and we're going to get into priorities in a second. If you get lost, this is something I stole fair and square from the Boy Scout manual. Stop. Use the acronym STOP. And that is actually STOP because walking in a circle isn't helpful. So you want to stop, sit down, don't keep walking. If you have a cliff bar, one of those kind of bars, you know, just sit down and have, have a little bite to eat. And the T is for think, okay? So are there any immediate dangers? I want to address that first. Is, is my life in danger for any particular reason? Probably not, but address that first. Um, but once you calm down, because remember, when we get lost, that sinking feeling, you can't think straight. Once you stop and you start, sit down and start thinking, you may be able to remember how you got there. You've calmed down. It's like, okay, I think I know my way out and work it out that way. Observe is the O. Okay, so stop, think, observe. Start looking around. Oh, wait, that water tank on the hill there, that was on my left when I came in. If I just put that on my right, I think I can walk out. So you want to observe, and then the last thing is plan. Plan on what resources do you have, what resources are available, how am I going to deal with this survival situation? And that's going to lead us into priorities, but there is one thing that I think is kind of interesting. It's not real bright in here. And, um, but I want to read, this is a analysis of lost person behavior. This is a search and rescue book. This gentleman wrote this book for search and rescue, but this is kind of an interesting thing that I read in here. And I always like to tell people this because it's, it is kind of fascinating. It says a lost person capable of going three miles in any direction. Okay. Capable will cut, will create a search pattern covering up to 28 square miles. Anybody here good with math can figure out three, three, three. You got 28 square miles. So here's the funny thing about that is to cover an area this size thoroughly would take 264 searchers searching for 12 days. 
That's pretty amazing. That's why you got to be self-reliant and get yourself out of these issues. So let's talk about priorities, how we address priorities in a survival situation. And I've got my Southern or San Diego hiking group. Are you guys okay to come on up? So come on up here. I'm going to move this table back for just a minute. If you can come stand in front of the table, and you guys can get in on this too. So I'm just come, kind of come out in a row here so everybody knows. So let's, oops, sorry. Once we get through these priorities, we're going to learn how to address each priority. You guys can't see over there. <laughs> you all right? Okay, so what is our first priority? Oh, first priority is food. <laughs> it's like Bear Grylls jumps out of the plane and kills something right away. All right. Water. Water is first. All right. Shelter before water. I like that. Okay, where's my shelter? Shelter's there, and that is before water, so that's good. Anybody have any other ideas how to put this together? We're going to do it, you know, left to right like we read. Positive, positive added. Positive we did talk about that a little bit, didn't we? That should be first, right? All right. So let me move it over to first. You can hold both of those. So what should be next? You're going to get another card in a minute. Water? Shelter? Well, I want you to think of it like a pilot's checklist. You may not need it, but this is more important if it were a concern. Does that make sense? So we're, we're doing it like a pilot would do a checklist. Yeah, you know, I don't need, you know, carb heat. I don't need carb heat and so on. What's that? First aid and safety. First aid and safety will come after positive attitude. Okay, I'm going to give you a, so you're going to have two. Oh, actually, first aid and safety. Here's food. All right, we'll give you some cards in a second. Hang in there. I don't, I don't want you to feel left out. All right, so we have positive attitude. We have first aid and safety. And then what, what do you think of these three left here would be more important than the other. Water before shelter next. Shelter next. Hold on to shelter. And then we have food and water. Everybody says water is first. Go ahead and switch. I'll get you to take care of it. Okay. <laughs> I don't want you to feel left out at all. <laughs> all right. So, all right. So there is, and Again, you know, let me show you guys something while they're up here. Kind of show you how this all started for me. So, you know, over 30 years ago when I got into hiking and backpacking and stuff, I wanted to put together a survival kit. And as I searched everywhere, searched books, searched the internet, and I came up with this list of items to carry in my survival kit. So at the time, I couldn't afford a pack mule. Um, <laughs> And I, and I started thinking there really has to be a better way to do it. And then I came across what's called the rule of threes. And I've modified them a little bit. I'll explain what I've done with them. But the rule of threes say you can live three seconds without hope. That's your positive attitude. Okay? You're not going to die in three seconds, but you're setting the tone for your whole survivor situation. Okay? You can live three minutes without air. Air is a metaphor for bodily functions, first aid and safety. If you're bleeding out, you're dead anaphylactic shock, other kinds of shock, you're going to die. So you've got to address that. So three seconds, three minutes, you can live three hours without shelter. That's keeping your body core temperature at what? You guys looked at the card, didn't you? <laughs> All right, 98.6, that's our core body temperature, right? That's standard body core temperature, right? So you can live three hours without shelter. You can live three days without water. I know everybody's saying, well, what about in the desert? You know, it's, isn't water more important than shelter? People have died in the desert because they didn't do one thing. Shade up. Isn't shade shelter? Shade up. Okay? So that shelter is more important than water because in the middle of the day in the desert, if I'm lost, I want to shade up. I'm going to put up a tarp. I'm going to get into a, an area where it's shaded, and then I'm going to cool my body down. Then I'm going to start worrying about water, which I might look for when it's uh, more dusk time evening time versus middle of the day. But they, people have died from exposure, from hyperthermia in Arizona especially, and they've had water with them. It wasn't that, They're, they just overheated. And so shelter is more important. That's a, 
Christopher and I go back and forth on it, and he still doesn't understand my thinking, but shelter is more important. You, you're in a desert, you gotta shade up. You're in cold climates, you gotta warm up with shelter and fire and so on. So three hours, three days without water, obviously in the desert, you wanna address that a little quicker, but finding the rule of threes. And three weeks without food. I could probably go a little longer myself, but you can go three weeks without food. So this was the system I learned, and I always felt like it wasn't complete, like what's missing from this system? And I started studying and, and doing these kind of things, and I realized there's a couple things. One of them is signaling. You guys can see over here. Signaling for rescue. Where would that come into play? Anybody have any ideas where signaling might come into play? Where would you, where would you do that? After shelter and fire. After shelter and fire, okay. So she's on the right track. I would do it on a parallel with shelter and fire. What I would do is as soon as I've addressed life-threatening injuries, I'm gonna put my signal mirror and whistle around my neck and be ready, because it might be something as simple as you're lost, but all of a sudden you see a hiker on a ridge over there, can't yell that far, but you could whistle, you could use your signal mirror, those kind of things, I'm ready. So to me, that's kind of on a priority, you know, it's kind of a parallel priority, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, so be ready to signal. And we'll talk, we're gonna talk about each of these in, in depth as we go. Uh, navigation, when would you navigate your way out? Okay, navigation's important because you forgot to tell somebody responsible where you're going and when you plan to come back, and now you're gonna have to find your own way out. After water? Exactly, after water, very good. A plus for that student. <laughs> so, <laughs> navigation, you get food. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you have your shelter made and you have a water source and now you navigate your way out, leaving yourself a breadcrumb trail, which we'll talk about later, because I went the wrong way. I've got to get back to my shelter where my water source is. Come back. Next day, you go back a different direction and so on. So that's where that would come in uh, to play. And the last thing is sleep. I mean, we're all adults. Probably everybody here has gone one night without sleep. You know, you get, get a little loopy. Two nights, you're, you're just making really, really bad decisions. So this is a priority, but your shelter and fire should facilitate your sleep. But I like to mention it because it is important. A lot of people just want to stay up and, and such. But it's really important to make yourself comfortable so you can get some cat naps and be clear thinking. Because you're not clear thinking when you're tired, especially if you've been up all night. Two nights, you know, I've never done it two nights. I've done it one night and I'm not feeling great. So these are the priorities that we work with. And then we, if you, address these priorities, and I have little handouts for you that have all this and ideas what to put in, but we're gonna go through and address each priority now so you guys will kind of have an idea of what to do. But I like this system much better because if you know these, this rule of threes plus the, the three items I added to it, if you know this and you build your survival kit based on what you know, based on what you're comfortable carrying, you know, I may say a flint and steel set and you go, I don't know how to use flint and steel set, then you carry something else, but you put in what you want to put in to address each priority, you're going to have a complete survival kit. Okay, any questions on this before we get into the priorities themselves? Okay. Where can we find this online disorder? Um, I'm going to give you a uh, handout. Matter of fact, did you print out any handouts, John? I, th I think I have enough. Um, they're on the printer. <laughs> Pass these down. If I don't, I will give you guys my website or something, and you can get it on my website. But these are done all, all pretty for you and stuff, so pass those around. Okay, so let's talk about each of the priorities and what we're going to put in our kit to address each priority and then I can, and that's really what this whole talk's based on is what am I gonna, you know, I'm gonna build a survival kit that works for me based on the things I know how to use and so on. All right, so, so our number one priority was what? Positive attitude. What would you guys put in your kit for positive attitude? Anybody have any ideas? <laughs> I'm downgrading you to a C student. Um, <laughs> All right, yeah, if, it were, if that works for you, you know, um, but realistically, a picture of your family. If you don't like your family, a picture of your dog or cat. 
So those are the kind of things. And, and I know people that actually, um, very religious people, and they'll put Bible verses uh, in their kit, you know, because that gives them the positive attitude, the will to go on. So whatever it is, I, I think I heard an interview with uh, Bear Grylls, who don't do anything he does, but um, <laughs> heard an interview with Bear Grylls, and he keeps a laminated picture of his kids in his shoe, like underneath the, uh, the what do you call that, the insert in your shoe. Okay, I, just, I have a picture of my, my wife and kids in my wallet, and I always have my wallet with me even when I'm hiking, so that takes care of the positive attitude. Whatever it is that you want to put in there, you put in there. Okay, so that's a really easy priority to address. Put something in that you're going to look at, going to give you the will to live. For some people, they make these little laminated survival cards. For them, that's, that's what works. You know, it's like, oh, I know I can look at this and, and go on. So a lot of instructors that I've seen, survival instructors, mistakenly use that second priority, which in the rule of three says three minutes without air after three seconds without hope. And air is really just a metaphor for bodily functions. So you've got to be able to address any life-threatening injuries. And this is where I tell you guys I think it's really critical, um, especially if you have a partner you hike with and so on. It's, it's really critical to take a good, not just a first aid class for you guys, but a, but a wilderness first aid class and learn all the different things and how to address them. It's really a critical thing. I, I used to hike with a particular friend of mine who's since passed away, but we would take the classes together so we could help each other. So it's really nice that, and you, Sue brought up that point earlier. She had taken one of my first aid classes and then she would drag other people to say, hey, I'm hiking with you. You gotta know how to, how to take care of me if something happens to me. So take it with your partners, take it with your group you hike with, take a good first aid class, but take a, if you can do a two day wilderness first aid or a wilderness responder and you're gonna learn you know, how to address, wilderness first aid, they, typically use what's called the march algorithm, which is um, they'll go down that, that's the first thing you're gonna deal with, which is massive hemorrhage. So if somebody's bleeding out, you gotta stop that. So with march, it's massive hemorrhage, airway, make sure they have a patent airway, their airway is good, you have to do a head tip chin lift, whatever it is you need to do. Uh, respirations is next. Circulation and heart not beating, you're gonna have to do CPR, which if you're out in the wilderness, you know, the odds of them making it are pretty remote, but you know how to deal with circulation. And then the, the last thing is going to be hypothermia or hike versus helicopters, different ways to address it. But take, take a good survival class and learn how to know the signs. Learn the signs. What does it look like when somebody's got a heat-related injury, when they're getting hyperthermic, too hot, or hypothermia, too cold? What does that look like? We'll get into that a little bit more. How about what is um, altitude, you know, when you have acute mountain sickness? That can easily become... HACE or HAPE, high altitude cerebral edema, high altitude pulmonary. What does that look like? You know, you gotta get that person descending quickly if they go into those kind of things. So those are important to know about. Hyponutremia, that's, you've heard of that probably, water poisoning they call it. You're drinking, 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 not taking in electrolytes, and now you're gonna get nauseous, you're gonna get lightheaded, and you're gonna feel awful. It's not, I had that once, it's not a great feeling. Uh, heart attack versus cardiac arrest. They're not the same thing. I know a lot of people think it's the same thing. They're not. They're, heart attack can lead to cardiac arrest, but heart attack, your heart's still beating. Cardiac arrest, your heart's either not beating or not beating. Do we have any doctors or nurses here can talk me through? <laughs> okay. So, yeah, so with, with cardiac arrest, you're either in a, a rhythm that's not pumping blood or you're in flat line. You see that on the uh, TV shows all the time. person goes flat line, right? And they take the paddles and shock them. It doesn't work like that. You're flat line, the paddles do nothing. You have to get drugs injected and, and such. But if you have an irregular funky heart rate, uh, rate then paddles will work for you. Um, so basically, I don't want to get on into too much. It's not a first aid class. Take a good first aid class minimum. Take a, a wilderness first aid class if you can. So some of the common myths in wilderness medicine um, is to scrape out a bee's stinger. Have you guys heard that? Don't touch it. It's going to inject more venom. That's been disproven. That's a myth. This, this is one of my favorite ones is... When somebody goes from uh, heat exhaustion, which, which is pretty dangerous, to heat stroke, which is deadly, you'll, you'll hear, and still there's some first aid books that still say this, say the sweating stops. A couple EMTs killed a guy after the Boston Marathon because he was still sweating. They're thinking, oh, he's not in heat stroke, he's sweating. 
he was in heat stroke. So you can still be sweating in heat stroke. So be aware of that. Learn. So a good first aid class is going to help you differentiate with some of the new things that they've learned over time and such. Go back to the grease thing. Should I take it out? Pull it out. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it doesn't, you know, they say you don't need to scrape it anymore. So it's, it's you know, wilderness medicine's interesting. There's always new things coming on board. And I go, every once in a while I'll do the, the wilderness medicine uh, seminars. And they're, they're, a lot of it goes above my head because it's primarily for doctors and paramedics and nurses. But the little tidbits you pull out are fascinating. It's, it's good to know some of that stuff. All right, so now we've addressed the first aid, the the three minutes without air, and we know we, we, how to address these things, take a first aid class. Now we have thermal regulation, okay? Keeping your body core temperature at 98.6, right? And, and that is important for you guys. You know, not everybody carries a thermometer with them, but core temperature is not measured under the tongue. Core temperature is measured the other direction of the body, all right? So I remember I walked into a pharmacy not too long ago and I asked the pharmacist, I said, I need a rectal thermometer. And she said, they're pretty much as, you know, the same. And I said, well, I can assure you from experience, they taste completely different. Um, <laughs> but that's, you know, that's where you measure your, your core body temperature is rectal thermometers. We're not carrying that stuff. So we've got to kind of look for the signs to know what, what's going on with somebody. And we'll talk a little bit about the signs. But these things can happen... Um, hypothermia, hyperthermia can happen really quickly. You know, for, for hypothermia, you could fall through the ice. We talked about a little bit earlier, you know, people falling. You could be in an icy condition, fall through the ice. You're going to get a real fast onset of hypothermia. Or it could just be out hiking and you're in cold conditions and your body's just constantly losing heat. So there's a lot of ways it can happen. Just keep in mind it can happen quickly or it can happen slowly for both, both hypo and hyperthermia. All right, so how do we deal with it? How do we deal with hypothermia shelter, right? We talked about shading up if it's too hot. We're in Arizona hiking. Water is, is important, but getting into that shade is even more important, okay? So you want to get sheltered up. And then in addition, if it's cold, you want to create fire if you can. If it's a safe environment and you're able to make a fire, I think it was two hunters that made that fire in mammoth that like burned down half a mammoth area that the whole area so just you want to be safe with fire you want to understand we'll talk about how to make fire and we'll talk a little bit about how to build fire but make sure it's safe when you do that before you do any kind of shelter the simple question to ask yourself is do i want to cool down or do i want to warm up what am i trying to accomplish with my shelter it's a hot day you know and, and i've got to get into the shade well, in that case, laying on the, on the cool ground is going to be beneficial to you. Cold day and you're making a shelter, you better get something under you to insulate your body from that cold ground. Otherwise, you're going to lose body heat, right? You know, it's, everything's traveling from warm to cold, so your body, is the warmth is going to be sucked out into that uh, ground. And that's why we have sleeping pads, right? When we go backpacking, camping, we have sleeping pads. We don't put our sleeping bag directly on the ground. It's not just for comfort, but that's why they have our values. You know, how much is that going to insulate me from the cold ground? So you want to think about these things. Do I want to cool down? Do I want to warm up? What am I trying to accomplish with it? So let's talk real quickly about hypothermia, okay? Hypothermia is getting too cold. That's a body core temperature of 95 degrees or less. And how do we lose heat from our body? So there's a few different methods of losing heat from our body. First one that you'll know about is conduction. We just talked about that, transfer of heat from something warmer to something cooler. So conduction, laying on that cool ground is gonna suck the body heat out of you. Great in the summertime, horrible in the wintertime. Um, we lose it through convection. Our body has this little bit of warm layer of, of, you know, that it keeps close to the skin. I don't know how to describe it any better, but your body just always has this warm layer. But as soon as the breeze goes by, it moves that layer, you gotta regenerate that. That's why, given the same temperature, you feel cooler when it's breezy out. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so that's, that's convection. Radiation is radiative heat loss, magnetic heat loss from your body out into the atmosphere. And no, you don't lose most of your heat through your head. That's a myth also. You lose most of your heat through any open source of skin. So if you put on a, you know, a nice cap and you're real warm and you know, take off your shirt, you're going to be cold because you have that exposed skin. Most people say they lose most of the heat through their head because most people aren't wearing a hat at the time. 
put on a hat, you're going to be fine with everything. But no, it's not. I think it was that um, people had told me that. I was like, oh, really? And then I went to one of those things with my kids where they have that, you know, you walk in front of this thing, it shows you where your heat loss is. And, and I noticed it wasn't mostly from my head. It was, you know, it, it was anywhere where there was exposed skin. So that's just something to think about. So that's radiation evaporation, right? How's, how does evap That's why you don't want to wear that cotton shirt uh, in a survival situation at night because it gets cold. So evaporation, get out of a pool. Everybody around you is like, they're oh, so hot out. You get out of the pool, what are you doing? You're shivering, right? Your body's changing. The body doesn't want that water on it. It's changing that to a gas that takes energy. Okay, so we have evaporation. Last thing's respiration. That's just breathing, right? You're exchanging warm air in your lungs for the cold air outside if it's too cold. Not breathing would be kind of counterproductive, <laughs> right? We've got to breathe. So what, what could we do? Maybe put a bandana in front of our mouth and warm that up, and then when we come back in. So those are the heat loss mechanisms to understand, and that's why we don't want to get wet. That's why if it's breezy, we want to, you know, button up and zip up and things like that to protect that warmth layer, put on some gloves, those kind of things. So stages of hypothermia, you're going to get, what's the first thing that happens when somebody gets cold? Start to shiver, right? Stages further down, they're going to stop shivering, but as soon as you see somebody starting to shiver, you want to kind of check them, you know, what's going on? And there's something called the umbles. Anybody here ever hear the umbles? Fumbles, stumbles, mumbles, and grumbles. So what's happening is your, your body's pretty smart. When you get too cold, your body is taking the blood from your extremities and bringing it into your core to protect your core. All right, you need to protect the vital organs, you need to protect your brain, your core stuff. So the blood's gonna come from the extremities. Well, our muscles don't work real well without blood in our muscles. So fumbles is the first thing, you know, can't do a button. You don't have the dexterity in your fingers to do that. Stumbles, you know, not going to be able to walk a straight line. Uh, mumbles, you're losing in your mouth, you're losing blood flow. So your tongue's kind of like not working, you're talking like you're inebriated kind of thing. And grumbles, that's a big one. You know, you, the person loses their interest in what's going on. Um, we had that on a scout trip where one of the kids got really cold. They, they didn't know it. Actually, I wasn't on. It was relayed to me. I wasn't on that trip. And they came to find him. Everybody's sitting around the fire. They're all having a good time. They came to find this kid curled up in his tent, no pad or anything. He was on the ground because he had gotten too cold on the hike. Luckily, they got to him in time, got him in front of the fire, warmed him up. But that's the grumbles. That's that I don't care attitude. And people get that. So what can you do, you know, besides we'll talk about shelter and fire, but what happens in those situations? Like, I think this person's shivering. Do I think that they're in a, in a bad situation? You can have them do a simple test, you know, dexterity. Just, just take each finger and touch it to your thumb. And if you can do that, you've got fine motor control. You don't have the umbles at that point. But if they're shivering, that's, that's a clue. Let's get them into some warmth. Let's get them out of any wet clothes, those kind of things. So, you know, that, that's what you're looking at. Look if they can do that. And I've got a good friend of mine that's a... Um, also teaches this and he always tells his students you know it's like, I don't bring cordage with me I can make cordage out of yucca or milkweed or nettle and like yeah we all teach that we can all do that but how are you going to do that if you don't have the dexterity carry the cordage it's really important carry the cordage with you with your shelter so understanding the heat loss mechanisms really help and then what do we do if somebody's getting too cold we want to definitely start to warm them up Shelter and fire are what's going to warm them up. <clears throat> like I said, get them out of any wet clothing. That's critical. Um, you can rewarm them in a sleeping bag with another person if, if need be. That skin-to-skin -skin contact helps. Sometimes just being in a sleeping bag. And if they're able to drink, give them some warm fluids if they're able to drink. Don't give it to them if they're not able to swallow and they're really having a difficult time. So, like, you know, just to mention again, long before you die of her hypothermia, your body's going to start to shut down. Look for those signs. Look for the umbles. Look for that dexterity. Test that person and get that person warmed up. On the other end of that, we have hyperthermia, too hot of a body core temperature. And that's when we get our body core temperature to about 104. This is, I'm giving you these numbers just in case one of you want to carry that rectal thermometer around and check people. But 104 are greater. All right, that's when we're getting into, into hyperthermia. The person's getting too hot. All right. So how can that happen? They're exercising vigorously in hot weather. That's one of them. 
or you're just hiking and your body's not cooling off. All right, most of you people here live in San Diego and in the summer times, what happens at night? It cools off very nicely. Yeah, go to Las Vegas and see what that's like at night in the summertime, it doesn't cool off. So if your body's not able to cool off and you're just hiking and hiking and hiking, you're gonna get overheated. And what are the signs? You know, a person's gonna start to get a little bit dizzy. Um, they're gonna possibly be vomiting. It, they, could, they could be nauseous and vomiting. Um, headache, rapid pulse, again, you'll learn this stuff in the first aid class. But when the person starts getting overheated, and this starts out, sometimes it could be as simple as something like heat syncope, which is the medical term for fainting. Somebody can faint. I had this happen on one of the walks I was doing at Malibu Creek, one of the docents. It was a warm day, it wasn't particularly hot, but I, I saw him and he was kind of swaying a little bit. And I lo looking at his knees, his knees are starting to get weak. And, I uh, asked a couple of guys, you know, stand next to him, and, and he just went down, boom. Why is that happening? Okay, so it's the opposite of what's happening in the cold. Your body wants to cool down. How does it cool down? Evaporative heat loss. You sweat. That's why you sweat. Your body wants to cool down. You sweat. So the blood's leaving your brain, leaving your organs, going out to the peripheral to get that coolness from your skin because you're sweating. And if that blood, you know, especially for elderly people, if you're on medications too, um, when that blood leaves the brain, you get lightheaded and you can pass out. Within 30 seconds, this guy was fine. I always carry, so I do a lot of walks with little kids and stuff, and it's fun. I always carry one of those little spray bottles of water, and they love it. You know, it's hot. You just spray them down, and they're digging it. Uh, you know, I just sprayed him down a little bit. He opened his eyes. Within 30 seconds, he was on his feet again. He was okay. But we sat him down. It's like, hey, sit down here. Cool off a little bit. That kind of stuff. So, so heat syncope. Next thing is going to be heat cramps. You're going to get heat cramps. And that's typically in the, in the thighs, sometimes the abdomen, that kind of thing. Again, get somebody into the shade, cool them down, give them some electrolytes. If they have electrolytes with them or if you can share electrolytes with them, 20 minutes, they're going to be fine to go out. Then you start getting into things like heat exhaustion. And that's when you start seeing the signs of the nausea, the vomiting, those kind of things. And that person, you really need to cool that person down, get them into some shade, spray them down. Um, if you can get them into air conditioning, that's even better. Those are the kind of things you're going to look for with somebody that's just getting way, way overheated. I wouldn't let that person back that day. You know, if you're on a hike, I'd make sure they cool down and stay okay for several hours to a day at least. Then from heat exhaustion, you get into heat stroke, which is deadly. Somebody's starting to show the signs of heat stroke. Again, they can be sweating. That typically happens with um, exertive heat stroke. So somebody's exercising, they're sweating but your sweating mechanism does stop. They could just still have a lot of moisture on their body and they'll be in heat stroke. Once you're at that level, and the only way to tell the difference, okay, this is, this is one thing you walk away with today, know this, heat exhaustion to heat stroke, altered mental status. That's the only way to tell the difference. They start acting like they're drunk and they have a complete altered level of consciousness. They're not making any sense. That person might be in heat stroke, probably is in heat stroke they got to cool down fast. If you have enough people, you can walk them into a body of water, that's ideal. That's like the most, that's the best thing you can do for that person in the field, especially. Cool them down, you don't have that. If you can wet down their clothes, especially the under the arms, the groin on the sides of the neck, you can wet down some things, put some things there, ice packs. We're not gonna have ice packs out in the wilderness, but cool them down, you know, hopefully they don't get to that point. Hopefully you're recognizing those signs sooner. All right, so that's, that's the stages of hypothermia, hyperthermia. You'll learn more about that in, um, in a first aid class as well. But look for that altered mental status when you know from heat exhaustion to heat stroke. Okay, so, so how do we keep warm again? We're talking about shelter and fire, right? So shelter is number one thing because you can't always have a fire. So I'll talk about I usually do fire first, but that's because where I teach it, the wind comes up in the afternoon. I want to avoid the wind and setting the place on fire. But we'll, we'll do shelter first. So what do we do for shelter? Um, let me get out a few things here just to go through with you guys. Okay, so with shelter, sit pads always good to have with you. You know, um, we're, we're on a hike. And this was Mount Baldy, I believe, if I remember right. And one of the girls got real, real cold and she wanted to sit down. You know, you sit down on a cold rock, what's going to happen? It's going to pull the heat out of your body. 
sit on one of these things, insulate yourself. So that's always a good thing to have. But let's talk about some other shelter items that you guys can have with you. And unfortunately, we're inside, so I can't rig up tarps, but I'm going to explain how we rig up a tarp. So number one is this foil blanket, right? Who here has one of these in their kit? Okay, throw it away. Um, <laughs> no, no, I'll show you guys. So this is a one-time use. You guys all know that. You will never, ever, ever fold it back up the way it is. They, yeah, they're a little fragile. If you have not ever opened one, um, one interesting thing about them is in, in the daylight, you can see through them. I had a buddy of mine went up uh, Mount Whitney, didn't go to the top. He forgot his sunglasses. I'm like, why don't you just take your blanket and, you know, make a little sunglass. Just cut a strip and wrap it around and instant sunglasses. Doesn't have any UVA or UVB, but it does take the edge off of the sun. So this is like the big popular thing, right? So do you mind coming up for a second? <laughs> right on the spot here. Let's uh, go ahead and face everybody. I'm going to wrap this around you. Go ahead and hold on to that. <coughs> you see them giving uh, these people a uh, marathon, right? At the end of the marathon, everybody gets one of these things so they don't get uh, too chilled too quickly because they stop running. So the problem with these are really, the biggest problem is, for the most part, you need your hands, okay? We're inside, the wind's calm, but when I teach this on a breezy day, I will ask somebody, oh, start picking up some firewood to make your fire. The thing flies off right away, it's gone. Imagine, you know, you're using this as a blanket and you're sleeping with this, you're gonna wake up cold and you're gonna be looking about a half a mile down and then, oh, there's my blanket down that way. You know, you could rig up some cordage and stuff, I guess you could do that, but that's why I don't like these. I like these for first aid to cover a shock victim. Really important with shock to keep the person warm. But for survival, I think these are, these are very low on the, on the chart for me. Um, and that's the main reason is you lose use of your hands. I want to use my hands. Yes? Uh, we use those for signaling also. Yeah, they do work for signaling. Put it out on the ground, it stands out. It can, yeah, it reflects really well. And we'll, when we get to signaling, we'll talk some about that. So stay here for a second. Let me... Yeah. Get rid of this thing here. Has anybody not seen one of these? Everybody here seen these? I'm going to leave it up here. If you want to see it, if you want to take it, I'm not taking it home. Look through it and see how you can make sunglasses out of it. Um, so I, years and years and years ago, I found something much, much better than that. And that's one of these. This is the same kind of deal. It's reflective. You got to be careful with, with any reflective thing, even the blanket that you don't get too sweaty inside because remember, sweat's not good if, if it gets cold. Um, but this is, let's see, do you want to put, put that on there? Okay. Yeah, take the jacket off. So this has the same thing, the same, re what's that? No, this um, SOL is a company that sells a lot of these kind of things. It stands for SOL. What does that stand for again? <laughs> Survive Outdoor. Yeah, survive outdoor longer. Whoever, whoever named the company was a genius, though. So there you go. So that's the hood right there. So anyway, and you'll probably feel a difference almost immediately when you're in that thing. So that is, he has use of his hands. Um, I don't even know. I don't think SOL even makes this. He used to call it the emergency poncho or survival poncho. Now you can go on line and just look for mylar reflective poncho there's companies that sell like a whole pack of them they're good to have they're in every one of my kits so that's that's what i recommend much more so than the survival blanket for obvious reasons that you guys are seeing now he has complete use of his hands and now what's he going to do if you know if he decides he's going to lay down it's not going to fly off of him he's not going to have to go look for it but we got to come up with ways to cover the lower portion as well how are we doing on time by the way okay um, so there's bivy, there's bivy bags. I'm not going to open these up just because of, of time. Um, these are like giant potato chip bags and they make the, the little bit more expensive ones that are, I've actually slept nights in those and they're, they're really nice. They're, um, also made by SOL they're called the escape bivy and that's not reflective. It's much more comfortable. This one's like a big potato chip bag. Um, but the other thing for you guys, I'm going to trying to keep it as reasonable as possible and it folds up this this small and you can probably get these for free these are bread bin bags these are what they use in 
the supermarkets, once they bake the bread, they cover them with a big plastic bag on these racks. See those big metal racks and stuff? They cover them with those bags. And the bags, I, I went into my local store and I'm like, hey, can I get three of those? You know, how much is it? And the guy's like, I, nothing, don't worry about it. You know, they don't care. So this is what it looks like. You know, the, I showed you the folded version. I don't bother folding them back up. So here it is. And this can be used as a sleeping bag. You could get in this and protect the lower part of your body with this, right? So that's really good for that. So we can kind of do this kind of deal. How about a flotation device if I need to cross a stream? There we got a little flotation device that could work for us. How about, um, you guys, when we get to water, we'll talk about it. You ever hear of a transpiration bag making water from leaves? You put a bag on a tree. It's got to be a clear bag because you need the photons from the sun to hit the leaves mm -hmm. to cause photosynthesis to have the tree expel water. You could use this bag as a transpiration bag and you can make water from a tree. Please don't use oleander or a poisonous tree or anything. <laughs> But if you haven't seen it, look up transpiration bag. That's something we do on the, on the hands-on class. You feel different? If you, does it feel warm in that thing? I think so. Yeah. Except that I took my jacket off. So. And, and that, right. <laughs> That's true. And this also helps not, you know, this is going to help with uh, convective heat loss too because it's going to stop the breeze. So this kind of deal here is, these are good. Oh, the bag's this big? Okay, great. Yeah, so you know where to get them. But you guys that don't work at a hospital, go into your local supermarket and ask them for you know, if you could buy a couple bread bin bags, put a couple in your pack. Um, also, if you're making what's called a debris hut, so if you're making a primitive shelter, you can use this to carry leaves. Typically, we like to make them where the leaves are, but you could use this as a carry vessel. You could fill it with leaves, and you could plug the door with it once you've got all the leaves in here. You plug the door to your shelter. How about if you're out there, you're stuck out there, you didn't bring anything with you to insulate yourself from the cold ground. Fill this with leaves. Now you have a, an air mattress, so to speak, or a leaf mattress, really. You have a leaf mattress. If you have two of them, fill another one with leaves, and now you have a blanket on top of that. A lot of uses for a, you know, a bag that you'll probably get for free. You know, what are they going to charge you? If, even if they charge you a dollar or two, these are great. So, yeah, just go to your supermarket and, and ask them for a bread bin bag. Um, and then you can also use trash compactor bags, but I don't like them as much as the heat reflective poncho and so on. So, and that's, that's the one bread bin bag. I just put it in a Ziploc bag, but it's pretty small. You can put two of them in here and they really aren't going to take up much room in your pack.